you tonight. We have so much to be thankful for. It's not enough that we just clap and praise you, God, but that we worship you in spirit and in truth. And no matter what is going on in our lives, that we keep you at the center. God, that you would be at the center of everything that we do, of everything that we say, that our life would center around the cause of Christ. Oh, right now, Lord, bring us into your throne room. Bring us in. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. Oh, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you've picked us up. We enter your courts with praise. Oh, we praise you, Lord, for not leaving us where we were, but for breathing new life into our lungs. We thank you, Lord. Church, 
Jesus be the center of your church. As we get ready to head into our time of Wednesday night local church communion, let's just bow our heads and hearts. We're just going to pray. We're going to move right into that. I'm going to pray just for a moment, just for the Lord's blessing. 
and favor to shine upon this service and whether you're already standing in worship or at the altar or anywhere you are in this building and you don't have to feel any compulsion or obligation to this whatsoever but i want to do something a little bit different and that is i'm just going to pray for the next few moments and while i'm praying i just want you to pray out loud you don't have to you can pray in your heart but god can hear you in your heart he can hear you out loud but uh although god can hear your heart the devil needs to hear it death and life and the power of the tongue some of you just take authority tonight that god's going to bless in this house amen and so i'm just going to start praying and you just start praying out loud in the room it'll be all right god can understand all of us at the same time it doesn't matter what language we're speaking he understands hillbilly just as good as the rest of it amen and so whoever wants to participate i don't care if it's one two five or everybody in the whole building but uh, let's just spend a couple of moments and let's pray father in jesus mighty name we come to you oh god on behalf of this church we need you father this is a faith family this is a fellowship of believers we want to be filled to overflowing with the holy ghost we want to know the wisdom of the holy spirit we want to walk in the authority of the name and the power of jesus Lord, tonight, may the presence and love of the Father immerse every soul in this room, every person that's watching online. Lord, no doubt out loud there are people praying with their church family and friends right now in their living rooms, in their offices, and wherever they are. But, Father, tonight, I pray that the Word of God would go forth. And, Father, as it goes forth, may it do something inside of us. May it instill a desire to want to know you more, want to dig deeper in the Scriptures, want to memorize. Help us to walk in holiness and reverence and confession and repentance keep short accounts with God Lord fill us with the fear of the Lord fill us with the fear of the Lord mighty father Lord that tonight when we leave this building we will know there's a God in heaven that's still very much in control of everything that we are facing thank you that you've gone before us you're already blessing us you've already protected us you're already doing things in the heavenlies it's already been decreed and lord it's happening to us right now and so we thank you for the blessings the abundant blessings of god we thank you for how you're going to move in this not just worship and preaching and praying but in this time of communion we commune with you we commune one with another bless lord as we drink of the cup and break the bread as we remember the lord's death until he come so father fill this room with the glory of god fill the live stream with the glory of god fill our homes with the glory of god fill this community with the glory of god fill this parking lot with the glory of god we walk before you in reverence and fear and we say god do a amazing things in our midst in the mighty name of jesus and all of god's people shout it out hallelujah hallelujah you can either start lining up or go ahead and head back to your seat but you already know the drill and so i don't have to go through all of the pomp and circumstance everybody on this side of the screen line up on this side if you're going to do communion everybody on this side of the screen line up on that side for communion and uh, as the lines get longer as they are on wednesday night we can get some ushers and some servers to start bringing it to you as well you're under no obligation to participate this is between you and the lord and so you just get both elements, go back to your seat. We'll break bread together in just a moment.
Hallelujah. May that be the prayer of our heart tonight. Amen. Paul says, I have received the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death until he come. And the church agreed and said, Amen. Well, let's remain standing for a moment. We're just going to worship, and then we're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. So let's just lift our hearts, our hands, our voices, lift ourselves to the Lord, and let's worship him in spirit and in truth.
saying for the name of Jesus. Yeah. And I just feel like the enemy thought that he could just come in and bring in darkness. But oh no, our God is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come.
Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Students can be dismissed with Pastor Jesse for a little bit tonight. You can return to your seat. I love worship time. Amen. I love, look, I love to preach. I know what the Bible says about preaching. But I want to tell you something. All of these armchair critics that say, well, you know, things like the Asbury Revival don't have enough preaching. They, they just got too much worship. I don't know what they're going to do when they get to heaven if they get there. Not going to be any preaching that I know of in heaven. I mean, God will be doing it, praise God. But I'm telling you, there's going to be a lot of worship in heaven. The Welsh revival was one of the greatest revivals in the history of mankind as far as the church world is concerned. And for two years, it was called the revival of singing. It was the awakening of worship. And long before even contemporary worship, they were singing in, in Welsh in a language we wouldn't even understand. And yet two million people were swept into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, worship is powerful. They'll never discount worship. The Bible says that we worship him in spirit and in truth. So we believe that worship ushers us in to the spirit. And then the word of God allows us to worship in the truth. And you have to have both. So you can't have just one or the other, right? But I'm telling you, there's something beautiful about worship. And there's been something extremely beautiful as of late, just about uh, poetic worship that we've had just breaking out and just singing not even songs sometimes that we're familiar with and just allowing people such as on Sunday morning the music drops out and everybody just starts singing Yeshua or power in the blood or you know this past weekend uh, I went back and watched it again and when you guys sang it is well it was like louder than the September conference when 4,000 people were into this tent I mean it was absolutely beautiful so God's kick-started something here and the devil can't stop it no matter how much he tries and I'm just honored to be a, a part of it. Well, the man plan has me reading Ephesians so much, it's made me realize something. I spent two and a half years preaching through a book that I barely understood. So I'm just going to start it again tonight and see how far I get and just get a really go introduction surface level. And depending on what the Lord says, I'm just going to take some Wednesdays and I'm going to go back through Ephesians because there is more spiritual warfare in Ephesians than just the sixth chapter. And that's all I ever paid it, credence to it. Well, you know, the devil's talked about and in the sixth chapter. Well, really, the kingdom of God, the ministry of deliverance, the power of the Holy Spirit's on every page in every chapter of the book of Ephesians. And so I, I'm learning things as we've been reading it every day. Look, it's hard to read something every day or multiple times a day and throughout the week and not have it just bleed off the page into you. And so there's been a number of times, either reading it or listening to it being read, the Holy Spirit's kind of leaked off the page, grabbed me by the juggler vein and like, look at there, son, you preached two and a half years verse by verse and never saw this. That's the beauty of the Bible. It just comes to life. It just comes to life. And so we're just going to pray, and I'm just going to jump into Ephesians. I'm really just going to, I'm just going to teach my way through some stuff tonight. Chapter 1 is one of the most theologically misunderstood chapters in the entirety of the New Testament. And so I'm not going, to, not going to challenge you or myself or everybody online to bite all of it off at one time. It's more than I can chew on tonight theologically, there's no doubt. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of the sentence structure, maybe try to get through the first three or four verses, maybe five if the Lord will allow in the next few moments. And just every week, we'll just pick up a little bit here and a little bit there, and we'll just work through the book together. Amen? I think that's how preaching ought to be done. Systematic, word by word, verse by verse, thus saith the Lord. Because thus saith Greg Locke will only get you so far in life and probably get you in trouble. But thus saith the Lord will change you forevermore. Amen? So let's pray, and we're just going to theologically jump right into the book of Ephesians. Don't have some fancy title. Don't have a, a fancy series title. No, nope. book of Ephesians is fancy enough. We're just going to let the Word of God do the work in our heart. Father, bless our hearts and our minds to the Word of the Lord for the next few moments. Maybe not be distracted. Help Pastor Jesse and the crew as they deal with the students in the student center. But Lord, tonight, just soften our hearts. May we sit before you in reverence and fear knowing that you have something to say tonight you have something to say to every one of us tonight all of us collectively but each one of us individually need to be spoken to and we say we hear you lord we will listen holy spirit speak for your servant hears 
So bless tonight the moments we have in-house and online in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, the book of Ephesians is no doubt outside the book of Romans, the most theologically savvy book in the entirety of the New Testament, if not the entirety of the Word of God, especially when it comes to the idea of what we call soteriology, which is a fancy PhD word that means salvation. And aren't you glad that Jesus offers salvation to every single person in this room tonight? He does that, as we sang a moment ago, through the name of Jesus, through the blood of Jesus, through the power of the covenant that we have with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in Ephesians, we're just going to jump in, and what sometimes doesn't seem like important verbiage is very important words indeed, because every word of God is for our learning and for our admonition. Even introductions and conclusions and names in the Bible are important because they are words, and we ought to pay attention to the words. Because God took time to inscribe them in a book and inscribe them upon our hearts. So notice as we jump right in, Ephesians 1 and verse 1, we see the author of the book. And really the author of the book is the Holy Ghost working through this apostle. Paul, he names himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. And notice who made him an apostle. He was not mama called and daddy sent and seminary trained. He was an apostle by the will of God. And hear me and hear me well. You may be the most least likely person in the room as far as your education is concerned. But when the Holy Spirit sets you aside and anoints you and equips you, you do it by the will of God, not by the will of man. Because by the will of man, you will fail. By the will of God, you will always succeed. And Paul proclaims himself to be an apostle. Now I want to say this about the word apostle. It's a hot button word for some reason these days and it should not be. For years I heard, I studied, and I was taught to regurgitate that the word apostle means an eyewitness. No, it does not. And that is nowhere contained in the reality of the word of God. The word apostle means a sent one. A sent one. Now, no doubt, we know that the apostles were eyewitnesses to the glory and the majesty of the resurrection. But you do understand that they were, if I can use the word loosely, a different dispensation of apostles because there are 28 people in the New Testament that are called apostles. 28. Jesus, by the way, is one of them. So in the New Jerusalem, when the 12 various gates are named after one of the apostles, I promise you, the apostle Paul's name is not on one of them. He was not one of the 12 specifically with Jesus. Judas was, but his name won't be there either. He's in hell. It'll be replaced by Matthias. Acts chapter 1, you study that where they cast lots. Because those were eyewitnesses to the glory, the majesty of the resurrection of Jesus. But an apostle is a sent one. That's why later in the book of Ephesians, he says, and he gave some apostles. And when he gave the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, the teachers, the evangelists, it was after, after, ladies and gentlemen, the death of Jesus Christ, he went into the heart of the earth, he was resurrected, he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men, and those were the gifts that he gave to the church. And how long does the apostolic gift last? Till we all come into the unity of the faith. And so until the body of Christ is completely unified in the presence of God, that means there is still an apostolic gift that is very much available to the church. Now, I would have denied that reality and called myself a heretic five years ago. But it's the facts. The Bible will mess up a lot of what we call good preaching. We're like, whoo, that's good preaching. Read the Bible, you're like, oh man, that's garbage. So the word apostle does not mean an eyewitness. The word apostle literally means a sent one. And what's not the apostle Paul, a sent one. An apostle is somebody that is, if you will, a leader of leaders, a pastor of pastors, a teacher of teachers. He's an organizing individual that has such a leadership capability that leaders are drawn to him as a leader. That's someone with an apostolic anointing. Whether you use the word apostle or not, doesn't matter. We'll get to that. Eventually, when we get to chapter 4 and about 700 Wednesday nights, praise God. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's important. He sent of the Lord Jesus Christ by the will of God. Who's he sent to? Who's he an apostle to? To the saints. Notice two groups of people. To the saints which are at Ephesus. He's writing to the Ephesian individuals. Acts chapter 20. 
You have the culmination of this when he meets the elders on the riverbank. He says, this will be the finality of when I ever see you again. He kissed them. The Bible says they wept sorely and bitterly. He got on a boat, went to Rome. Two years later, they cut his head off. He never saw him again. And so the Apostle Paul led these people to Christ. He nurtured them, pastored them, discipled them. He loved them immensely. So he was called to the saints which are at Ephesus, but someone else, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Meaning by that, you don't have to be a saint at Ephesus. If you're a saint in Mount Juliet, Tennessee, the book of Ephesians is for you tonight in this room. To the saints. Now you'll notice. Let me just say this. I think it's important. The Bible was not written for lost people to understand. The Bible was written for God's people to obey. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spirits of the discern, neither can he know them. That's why you cannot argue religion, Christianity, with a lost person. They don't think the way that you think, and you know that to be true, because people used to do it to you before you got saved, and you could not fathom the idea of Jesus. And so the Bible is not a book for lost people to understand. That's why it's unhealthy for the church growth movement to use entertainment to fill their pews with a bunch of lost people for the value of entertainment. We are not here for the value of entertainment. We are here to feed the saints of God that are among us. And when you have well-fed saints, they will go out to the highways and hedges and lead people to Jesus Christ. So he says, to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Verse 2. See, it's amazing what you can get out of an introduction. Normally we just skip right over that. Well, he's just giving the introduction. No, that's important. Know who's talking. Know why he's talking. Know who he's talking to. Know your crowd. Grace be to you. Can I say, without grace you go to hell. Thank God for the grace that has been bestowed unto us. You know what the word grace in the Bible means? It means to enable you know what grace enables you to do? Enter the kingdom of God. We are enabled to be saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace, shout grace. grace. He said, for by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It, grace, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so because of the grace of God, we are enabled to be saved. Because of the grace of God, we are enabled to be delivered, sanctified, set apart. So grace is important. He said, grace be to you. And peace. Boy, don't our society need that. Everybody laying around worried, flipped out, basketball-sized ulcers, can't sleep at night, fretting, looking at the news. Things are getting worse, worse, worse. Well, lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws nigh. It's going to get so bad, Jesus had to show up to fix the whole thing. He gave us the keys to the truck. We put it in the ditch. And he said, look, I'm speaking peace over you. And so tonight, I say to this congregation, I speak peace from, fa from the Father over you tonight. Peace from the Father. Grace be to you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed. I like that. Blessed be the God. Now, let me stop and say this. You ever notice how we're always, bless us, bless us, bless us. God bless America. How about sometimes we bless him, bless him, bless him. David gave us, by the way, that theological concept in Psalm 103. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He begins and he ends, and in the middle of the sandwich, he says the same thing through the whole chapter. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You want to be blessed of God? Live a life that is a blessing to God. So he said, you lift up, you honor, you praise. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who watch this hath blessed us you see there's your transition you are blessed by him in direct proportion to how much you bless him Does that make sense we honor him he honors us we humble ourselves and exalt him, he exalts us. We exalt ourselves, he abases us, the Bible says in the book of James. And so he says, look, I'm going to put grace upon you, peace upon you. I'm going to bless you. Now watch how he does it. This is beautiful. 
who hath blessed us, that's the saints who are in Christ Jesus. He has blessed us with all, please notice please the next two words and then we'll pick up the rest of the sentence, with all spiritual blessings. With all what? With all spiritual blessings. Now, let me tell you why that's important. God never, ever, did I say never. God never bases your relationship to him on material blessings. He does not say he has blessed us with all economic, material, prosperous, financial blessings. That's what we want. Because we've been taught that's what blessing is. The car you drive, the home you live in, the clothes you wear, the status that you have, the letters before and after your name as far as your education is concerned. No, God says nothing about the economic welfare of blessings. Because you can be as rich as the day is long, but if you do not have a spiritual connection to God, you are bankrupt. Utterly, absolutely bankrupt. Who has blessed us, endowed us, lavished us with all spiritual blessings. Who cares if we know about the Bible, but we don't know the God of the Bible. Paul later said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended. Brethren, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. In a nutshell, here's what he said. You can be as rich as you want to, but without God you're bankrupt. You can have more money in the bank than you could spend in a hundred lifetimes. But God does not measure you by your blessings of economic value. He measures us by the spiritual blessings that he's bestowed upon us. The spiritual blessings. Which means you and I could be literally as broke as a joke, poor as Job's turkey, sit on a dime and dangle both legs, but being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit with the richest person in the room. Now, does that mean that spiritual blessings cannot turn into economic blessings? Of course, God blesses and prospers his children. If you get in God's kingdom economy, I'm telling you, two and two is not four. Because God don't work with addition. He works with multiplication. Give, and it shall be given, the Bible says. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Luke 6, 38. Philippians 4, 19. My God shall supply all your needs. So yes, God prospers his children. But he never makes an emphasis on material blessings. He always makes an emphasis on spiritual blessings. Let me tell you something. I would much rather, and I know God feels this way. I would rather my kids be spiritual than be rich. And that's what God says about his kids. I would rather you be godly than have gold. I would rather you be sanctified than have silver. I would rather you be Christ-like than have cash in the bank. He says it's more about the spiritual blessings. But notice where the spiritual blessings come from. This is beautiful. In heavenly places in Christ now look I'm not talking about visions I'm not talking about dreams I'm talking about reality nobody in this room has ever physically been to heaven don't throw your hand up because you ain't because the Bible says no man has ascended into heaven so you ain't done it you may have dreamed about it you may have had a vision about it I get it okay Paul went in a vision, and it was so unbelievably fantastical that when he got back, the Holy Spirit said, shh, 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 don't even write about it because people won't believe what you saw or heard. And he's like, okay. So, you have to understand that we don't know what heaven really looks like. The Bible is less descriptive than you could ever imagine. I mean, the Bible is not very descriptive. We have more about what the new Jerusalem is going to look like than we know what heaven's going to look like. 
But we know the heavenly places are the spiritual realm where God resides. I believe with all of my heart that if there was some physical, fantastical way for us to get in some type of a vehicle, if we knew exactly the coordinates where he hangeth out upon nothing, the, the open north space in the stars, if we knew exactly geographically how to get there, I believe we can actually take a trip and move into the, the third realm, the heavens where God is. It's a real place. It's not fictitious. It's not fairy tale. It's not La La Land in some red back hymnal. Matter of fact, some time ago, uh, Wayne and I had the discussion when our books started doing really well. And uh, he noticed that every time I would send him something in the manuscript or I would correct something, I would always capitalize the word heaven. And he said, I, I'm assuming that you're meaning to do that. I said, absolutely. He said, I get it. So I've had people say, why do you capitalize the word heaven? I said, you capitalize the word Tennessee, don't you? You capitalize Nashville, don't you? Why wouldn't I capitalize an actual place? If I believe it's real, it's a proper place. So it needs to be capitalized. Right? And so... He says, I'm going to bless you from the spiritual realm, from heavenly places. You see, we're looking at everything in the natural. God's working in the supernatural. That's the stuff I miss. That's the stuff that deliverance ministry, ministry, ministry has opened my eyes to. And what it's opened my eyes to is that the spiritual realm, if we could cut the veil, which is very, very thin in this room, it's more lively than what we're seeing right now in the physical realm. It's there. Heavenly places. We are seated with Christ. We'll see it later in heavenly places. You know what that means? If you are born again, bought by the blood of Jesus, you know what that means? That means you are going to heaven as if you were already there. Positionally, you are there. But practically, you're still a mess. Right? Positionally, we are there. It's like Colossians. People that are antagonistic and anti-deliverance ministry say, well, Colossians says we've been transfer transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. We have positionally, positionally, we've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness. We are in the kingdom of God, but practically we still got to fight the kingdom of darkness. So positionally, we're going to heaven as if we were seated there right now, but practically we got a lot of growth to do before we get there. And so he says the blessings come from heavenly places. You have to learn to view things through the lens of the spiritual realm. Stop always living in the natural. You know what I'm starting to learn? The natural is boring. Holy macaroni, the natural is boring. The supernatural is what God is looking to release in our lives. And he said, your blessings don't come from the bank. Your blessings come from heavenly places. But here's the common denominator, in Christ. The blessings come from Jesus. The blessings come from Jesus. Verse 4. I'm hurrying, not hurrying. Does that make sense? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to juice it for what it's worth, but I could preach an entire week on just each one of these verses. They're so rich. According. According. As he, watch this, hath chosen us. Do not let that give you the wiggles and the worries. <gasps> I've heard all these hyper-Calvinists talk about being chosen. First of all, it's a bad identification because they're not hyper about anything. It's a false theology. I'm sorry. He said, well, I just didn't know you believed that. I'm a hyper-Calvinist. That's cool. We can argue about it later, but we can argue about it right now. I got the microphone. I will never allow Calvinism to be taught in this church. It's a damnable doctrine. Jesus died for the sins of the world, whether you like that or not. It's amazing to me, hyper-Calvinists are always in the group that Jesus died for. I've never met a Calvinist say, well, you know, Jesus only died for a handful of people. I don't guess I'm one of them. They're always in the group. I'm like, uh, well, are you one of the elect? Well, of course I am. I've never met a Calvinist that said, well, you know, I'm a Calvinist. I believe in the sovereignty of God, but I just don't believe I'm one of the elect. No, they're always in the group. It's like a select little group of people. That's not salvation. That, that's like a fraternity. That's a sorority, right? That, that's ridiculous. And so he says, 
He has chosen us. Yeah, but notice how he chose us. In him. Listen, I don't know theologically how all of the framework comes together. Here's what I know. God chose me based on the fact that he knew with my free will I was going to choose him. So when you get to heaven, I believe the gate as you enter will say, Whosoever will may come. And when you walk through and turn around and look on the back side of the gate, it'll say, chosen in him before the foundation of the world. You say, which one's right? Yes! Both of them are right. I'm chosen in him. He chose me based on my choice of him. That's the facts. That does not take away from God's sovereignty, nor does it take away from man's free will responsibility. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. So God knew who was going to be saved before he ever even made the world. By the way, God knew man was going to fall. But he had a way to demonstrate his love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So before the very foundation of this world, he has chosen us. And notice what the choosing specifically does. That. The word that in the English language means here is the reason stated in the next phrase. That we should be holy. You know what God chose me to? Holiness. Righteousness. Separation from the world. He chose me and you and the church to be holy. And boy, that's a lost understanding in the modern culture. We think holiness is... A denomination that you grew no, 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 I'm talking about holiness before the Lord. I was on with the guys, the demon slayers, as we affectionately call them, for a promotional show that we're producing that will actually be out tomorrow night with the third and final trailer for the April 10 and 11 release for the Encore. And I was talking to the guys about, you know, an understanding of being holy and walking in the fear of God. And I said, you know what deliverance ministry has done for me? I said, it has made me want to walk so holy before the Lord. Because when you see the spiritual realm and you understand the wickedness, the depravity, and the darkness that is around us, it makes you want to fear God and walk in holiness. Because one thing's for sure, if you don't, those demons will call you out in front of everybody and think nothing of it. And he's chosen the church. He's chosen you. He's chosen us that we should be holy. You know what the word holy means? It means to cut apart. When you get born again, it's like God cuts you out of the cultural mold that you were born into. He cuts you apart. He perforates you away from who you were. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We walk in holiness. We're cut apart from who we used to be. We don't live the same. We don't talk the same. We don't act the same. Why? He chose us that we should be holy. Watch this. And without blame. That doesn't mean we will be without sin. I don't believe in sinless perfection until we get into the presence of God. So you're not going to be sinless. But if you walk holy, you will sin less. You'll keep short accounts. You won't live in disobedience and constant, continual rebellion. He said be without blame. Meaning by that, don't allow others to receive from you a poor testimony so that ultimately they're not blaming you. They're giving a black eye to God. Most people say, oh, you know what? I don't believe in God. Not because of God. They say, I don't believe in God because of his followers. So let's not give him any more of a black eye than he already has in the culture. We're to live holy without blame. Now watch this. Before him, not before them, before him in love. Before him in love. Let me tell you what salvation is. It's love. What's discipleship? It's love. What's deliverance? It's love. What's sanctification? It's love. We obey him because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, comma, keep my commandments. So why have we raised a schizophrenic generation of church-going individuals that tip God every now and again and say, I love Jesus. I just don't always do what he says. Oh, I love Jesus, and I believe the Bible, but I'm just going to live my own life. I'm going to sow my wild oats and pray for crop failure on Judgment Day. No, doesn't work that way. 
Because we are living holy and blameless, we do it before Him in love. What is the motivating factor in my heart to want to live holy? Because I love Him. And if you love Him, it will be demonstrated in the way that you live your life. So this buckwild culture that goes to church and pretends to love Jesus, but they have no real discipleship elements at all. They love him in word only, but not in deed. And Jesus said, this crowd of Pharisees draws near to me with their mouths, but their hearts are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. They deny the reality of the power of God in their life. They claim one thing with their lips and deny it with their life. He says in verse 5, Having predestinated. Someone's like, oh my goodness. That's that theological word of Christ. What does predestination mean? It means that God knows the pre of your destination. He knows your destination before you do. Predestination. The English language is beautiful, is it not? He is predetermined, having predestinated us. He knows unto the adoption of children. We're the adopted kids of God. Now, let me tell you why that's interesting. Okay? We are not the natural born children of God. John 8, 44, you are the natural born child of the devil. All right, he says plainly to the Pharisees, to the church growing mosaic crowd, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not of the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. When you were born, you were not born in the family of God. Get that nonsense out of your mind. The introduction to the Masonic Bible teaches the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That God is everyone's father, and everybody is my brother and sister in Jesus. That is nonsense. If that were true, Jesus would have been a fool to die for the sins of the world. There's no such thing as the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. You are born away from God. You are not a natural born child of God. Psalm 51 verse 5, we came forth out of our mother's womb speaking lies. You do not teach your kids how to lie. They do it on day one. They do it on day one. Nobody teaches them. Okay, Junior, I want you to lie. Nope, just give them a couple of weeks. They'll start doing it. You'll change them, you'll feed them, you'll warm them, you'll clothe them, you'll burp them, you'll pray with them, you'll lay them down. Not a thing wrong. Ten minutes, you would swear they had swallowed the bed sheet they're screaming so loud. Ah! You know why? They're natural born liars. We are born with a selfish nature. You are not born a child of God. You're born a child of the devil. So get this. In order to become a child of God, because you're not natural born, you have to be adopted into the family. So what you don't get, follow me now, I'm about to get stirred up. So what you don't get from God in the natural, you supernaturally get from God in heavenly places because adoption is not a natural transaction, it's a legal transaction. It's a legal transaction. Now look, we got 47 children, okay? Six. We got some adopted kids. When I launched out in the process of adopting my oldest son, Hudson Taylor, he's just a little bitty old wiggle worm of a guy. Now how he went from this to this, I will never know. But I found out some interesting things in the process on the highway of adoption. And if you've ever adopted, you know this. Adoption has a stronger legal case in the court system than natural born children. Now, for an adopted son, he can get little heart palpitations to get excited about this. Because here's the deal. I can write my own blood children out of my will if they make me mad. I can be like, <laughs> is that what it's going to be like? 
I can disown them legally and write them out of any inheritance whatsoever. But, not that he would, he can make me as mad as he wants. I can never disown and disinherit a legally adopted child. He automatically gets the farm, right? He's adopted. A legal transaction occurred that in the court system is a bigger transaction than actually physically coming down the birth canal with my blood in his veins. Because when you came down the birth canal, you plopped out a son and daughter of the devil. But when your name was entered in the transaction of heaven and you were adopted, Jesus said to the Father, they get the whole farm, Dad. They get the whole farm. They are the inherited ones by right of adoption. It's a legal transaction, which, by the way, that right there is the beauty of eternal security. I'm adopted into the family of God, and not even the devil can write me out of God's will. He has chosen us, predestined us unto the adoption of children by who? Jesus Christ. Not because of your goodness, not because of your baptism, not because of your experience, not because of your denomination. We're not born of man's blood, we're born again of his blood. By Jesus Christ to himself. Did you know the main purpose of salvation is the pleasure of God? Not just to keep you out of hell. Now, the pleasure of God keeps you out of hell because it's not his will and pleasure that any should perish, but he does it to himself. Watch this. According to the good pleasure of his will. You say, I just can't believe God would ever save me. Why would he do it? Because he wanted to. It made him happy. Revelation 4.11, everything was made for the pleasure of God. They are and were created. Everything God made was not for the purpose of fellowship. People are like, well, you know, God made humans because he was lonely. He has trillions of angels to keep him company. He's not lonely. He made man in his own image for his own glory, for the pleasure of his own will, so he could show the universe the love that he has for people that don't deserve it. By the pleasure of his own goodwill. Verse 6. Might just have to stop here. Can't believe we got this far. <laughs> to the praise. Say praise. praise. That's not our praise. That's his praise. Amen. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Well, we don't talk like that. We ought to write a worship song. The glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Why do we praise him? For the glory of his grace. His grace is glorious. You know why? Because it gets you to glory. <laughs> it's glorious grace. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Wherein he hath made us. He made us. Conformed us. Built us. Matured us. Nurtured us. He hath made us. Accepted in the beloved. <laughs> I got that phrase highlighted accepted in the beloved or beloved depending on if you're from the north or south accepted in the beloved right <laughs> we're beloved of the Lord I don't care how you pronounce it it means the same thing he loves us and because of his love, we're accepted in the beloved. So you better know this. If they don't like you, he accepts you. If they walk out on you, he walks in on you. The whole world can hate you. We're accepted in the beloved. If the Baptists dump you, you're accepted in the beloved. If the Catholics dump you, you're accepted in the beloved. If the Assembly of God dumps you, you're accepted in the beloved. If the white folk don't accept you, you're accepted in the beloved. If the black folk don't accept you, you're accepted in the beloved. He's broken down the middle wall of partition and we don't need a pope, pastor, or a priest. We walk in that we may boldly obtain help in a time of need. He did that for his own good pleasure 
because we're accepted. You say, well, I don't know if I like you. Jesus thinks I'm to die for. You don't have to like me. You do have to love me. Look, there's some folks I don't like. I love them. I just don't like them much. I, look, I love everybody I pastor, but this Sunday, there's some folks, I'm not going to ask them how they're doing because I'm afraid they'll tell me. I love them, but I don't like them much. But you better know something. If people don't love you and if people don't like you and if people malign you and people you know, slice your character and walk out on you, Jesus says, because of what he's done, you're accepted. You're part of the group. You're part of the family. You're grafted in, no matter what that crowd says. No matter how much people want to pull you out, you're accepted in the beloved. You are accepted. You know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and myriads of angels in the heavenly places right now know your name. Now, I hope you got enough Holy Ghost gumption that hell knows your name and it gets nervous when you wake up and your bare feet hit the floor too. But I'm here to tell you, heaven knows your name. As the old gospel song says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You ever heard somebody say, well, if you'd have been the only person in the whole world, Jesus would have done it just for you. Absolutely he would have. We're accepted. And I find that beautiful. And I'm just going to have to quit. I'm, not, I'm definitely not done. I'm just going to quit. But I'm going to tell you why I find that beautiful. Because in the narrative of the gospel, right here in Ephesians 1, God in one fell swoop speaks to the needs of every person in this room, no matter how or where you grew up. Because all of us, have one desire to be accepted it's why the spirit of rejection and abandonment are the number one and number two spirits that are most common in church people we're afraid of rejection we're afraid of abandonment but from the moment we are born from the cradle to the coffin we have one desire to walk into a room and feel accepted. To have a boss that appreciates our work and accepts us. To find a spouse that accepts us, warts and all, and loves us in spite of the craziness in our life. Children crave the accepting affirmation of their parents. I crave it. Let me tell you something, and I, I gotta quit. My kids, for example, like when Hudson and Kiara preached and they did an outstanding job. You know, they were seen around the world and people still talking about it, right? They got the conference coming up and all of that. But here's what's interesting. If 10,000 people email the church and tell them how fantabulous they did. But I never say it once. They would feel like utter failures. If every preacher in America said, oh, that was amazing. But their father said nothing. It would in their mind minimize every word that fell out of their mouth. And every hour they spent in prayer and Study of the message. You know why? Because children crave acceptance from their parents. So much so, now get this, I'm careful and reverent in how I say this because I understand the place of Jesus subservient to the will of his Father, 100% God, 100% man. But that is why God the Father, not having to, but setting a pattern for us. And men, may this be a lesson to all of us, including me. God the Father publicly gave to Jesus what every son 
craves from the lips of his father. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. And the father gave Jesus public acceptance and affirmation. And at that moment, the whole world knew. You better look out. Because the son has been accepted by the father and therefore he's about to burn the whole world down with truth. And every person in this room wants one thing, acceptance. And if you never get it from anybody else in your entire life, if you crave the, that a boy, that a girl, and that's okay, but you never get it. The greatest that a boy, that a girl you'll ever get is right here. You and I have been accepted in the beloved of God. And when the whole world falls apart and the culture's on fire, we are going to heaven as if we were already there. And if the whole world says, we hate you, God says, that's all right, because I love you. You are accepted by me. If you believe that to be God's word, get on your feet. Give the Lord some praise in his house tonight. We're accepted in the beloved Father. Thank you for Ephesians. Thank you that we get to live to the praise of your glory, mighty Father. Thank you, Lord for all that you will teach us in these verses. Thank you for what you've released in this house tonight, what you've released through a live stream screen tonight. And Father, when we go home and pillow our heads, may we know, yep, the world's in a mess. Yes, Jesus has to return. Yes, it looks like the kingdom of darkness is advancing everywhere around. Yes, craziness is everywhere. Truth has fallen in the streets. But we, because of you and your love and your blood, we've been accepted by the God of the universe. Now may we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we have been called. In Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, amen, amen and amen. I love you guys. Thank you for being here. Get around. Hug some necks. Shake some hands. If you're accepted in no other church, you're accepted in this one. This is your family. Amen. We love you guys. God bless you.